So this is uh, the second of a series that uh, I started. We did one uh, last month. It was the first one. And I call it um, Breathing New Life into Old Images. And this kind of came about, um, I don't remember how it came about, but uh, I think it was maybe for a perfect inspiration episode. Or maybe this, I did this webinar first and that and it, um, kind of spurred a perfect inspiration episode. But long and the short of it is, uh, the it, this got a lot of really nice feedback. People really enjoyed this uh, session because what it does is it shows just how um, much we can grow as photographers. And so here's what the the kind of crux of this webinar series is about. I go through um, I, I go through my older images, uh, stuff from like 2008, 2009, uh, and even some in 2010. So uh, anywhere from like uh, four to you know four years ago, three years ago, two years ago, um, and I look at images that I uh, when I see them I, I kind of cringe. Um, only not not because you know they're bad, but because I see how much I've grown as a photographer, and I want to share with you um, how I would change things now. So basically, what I do is like this is the first image, uh, and this is what I processed. I took this in 2009. Uh, you could see right here, uh, April 12th, 2009. Um, in, this was in uh, one of the subway stations in Boston, or actually in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And uh, I remember this. This was actually uh, right above on street level. There was a, a, a zombie festival. So people dressed up like zombies and walked down the streets. They were kind of lurching down. It was awesome. Um, but I headed down here uh, because it started to rain, and you can see how the, um, the floor is kind of slick. Um, and I saw this shot here. So I put my fisheye lens on and I got it. I love the tile floor here. That's like, uh, to me, that really jumped out at me. But I, I also love just how creepy it looked. Now, I stylized this using photo tools way back in the day. Um, and um, this is the result I got. It's an HDR image. And you can see here, um, this was before I really, this is kind of within the first year of starting HDR for me. And so I have five bracketed images. Um, that I took. Now, uh, in in retrospect, this was before um, Ken. We just started, you know, just uh, two minutes ago. I started about two minutes early, so you didn't miss much. I was just showing people this. This is the image um, that I want that I processed in 2009, and so we're going to reprocess it now. See if we can kind of make it more refined. Now, what I was saying is, look at these, um, look at the brackets here. Um, this is pretty much the standard bracket, uh, the normal exposure. And you can see that this is my darkest exposure. And had I had more HDR chops, don't worry about it all, Ken. No worries at all. Um, but had I had more chops, I would have reviewed the brackets. Because you can see if I cycle through here, look at, look at the, um, in my darkest frame, look at the light up here. I never bothered to look to see whether I got enough exposure. And over here, this is not enough exposure, or this is not a fast enough exposure. I should be able to see most of that bulb. Um, and I didn't. So as a result, no matter what I do, the tone mapping will suffer a bit. But that's okay. This is what we learn. Had I um, had more experience, I would have reviewed the bracket and I would have seen that, all right, I don't have a fast enough exposure for this information here. Uh, so I would stop it down a little bit more with shutter speed. All right, but that's the way it goes. I'm going to select these five brackets, uh, and I'm going to send them over to uh, Photomatix. We'll do a quick tone mapping. Don't have any ghosting, so we don't need that. And we'll see what we get. You know, it might not be that bad. All right, so here is the tone mapped image. Let's go ahead now and start messing around. The luminosity needs to come down a bit. Uh, detail contrast can come up, and then the gamma, the brightness, is too high. But it's looking good, you know, it's looking pretty good. I'll, I might bring up the white point just a bit. And what I'm doing is look over here, um, the histogram. What I'm making sure of is that there are no blown out highlights or uh, clipped shadows. And you can actually see, I'm actually surprised that this bulb here is not blown out. It actually has good data in here. So I'm, I'm happy because if it was blown out, which I can illustrate by bringing up the white point, you'd start getting a grouping up here on the right. And as I bring it up more, you see how it's bunching up over here? So that's what you don't want. You kind of want it to uh, ease into the ends on both sides. All right, so just kind of make a few quick adjustments. 
looking for that nice even exposure. All of uh, the detail is in the mid-tone area, which is nice. I have good shadow detail, good highlight detail. I'll just save and re-import and we'll bring it back into Lightroom. Okay, so let's compare the two here. Um, let's take this and this and compare them. So let's go lights out. Um, you can see that I restored all that detail in the door, which is really good. You couldn't really see any of that stuff here. Uh, we restored some of the fixture that the light bulb is sitting in, um, and that's really good. More shadow detail over here, and uh, just nice detail on the ground. So that's good. It gives us something to work with. Um, so now what I'm going to do is take this image over to the suite. We'll go to File, Plug in Extras, go to the suite, and we'll begin stylization. So, um, you know, for me now, the stylization component is really important, and it's probably what changed most next to the tone mapping. Um, my sensibilities around tone mapping uh, have evolved significantly, and the reason for that is tone mapping has been, um, uh, you know, I, I constantly say that tone mapping is a utility. It is not a stylization engine. You're not supposed to stylize in photomatics or um, HDR effects pro uh, two by Nick, that's an exception because HDRFX has some good stylization tools in it. But even then, I'm only looking to get this flat image. So I'm going to send this over to effects over here. And uh, the first thing I'm going to do is go to the movie looks category. And for me, again, the first effect I always apply is the one that will go to the, you know, as much of the image as possible. And so my baseline is going to be urban sickness. Um, and the reason for that is because I really enjoy what it does to lights. So you can see here, let's bring that down to zero. Let's bring it up just a bit. We don't need to go 100%. And what I'm also going to do is bring up the blending options just to see if there's a blending mode that might uh, work. So uh, multiply, soft light, hard light. I kind of like hard light a lot. So I'm going to bring that up just like that. Hit apply. We'll hit add, we'll continue on. So I'm applying that uh, urban sickness to the whole image. Now for the tiles here. So I'm gonna look at something like um, pastel colors. I'm gonna see what that does to the tiles. It's okay, I'm not too thrilled with it. Let's go to uh, maybe Thermopylae. And so this is exactly what I do when I'm editing my own images. This is exactly what I do, I'm like all right, you know, I want the tiles to be to have its, their own effect to them, so it's looking okay, but I'm not too thrilled with it. Um, I might go to. Let's see. Let me see. Let me see uh, if I got the blues with a blending mode can be good. All right, blending options. Let's go to multiply, soft light, hard light. Let me so see what soft light does. No, I'm not feeling it. But this is how it goes, you know. I don't really script these things uh, in advance. Ooh, fashion passion might be good. I like I like fashion passion. Let's see what the blending mode what we got. Multiply soft light, hard light, soft light. There we go. So you see, I found what I like. I'm gonna go here, bring it up to about maybe a little more than halfway. Okay. Hit apply. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna uh, take my masking brush bring up the inspector and invert. So that hid the uh, masking brush, or it hid the effect, and it put the masking brush in a painted mode. So I'm drawing the effect where I want it. Now I'm gonna also bring up the mask in an overlay, and this will show me exactly where um, the fashion passion effect is being applied. So I'm gonna get uh, kind of towards the edge here. Again, I only want the effect to apply to the tile floor. I don't really want it anywhere else. Um, and that's uh, how I start kind of basing the look of my image is based on the elements in the scene. So you can see here, just kind of getting here. I'm not going to go too crazy uh, by getting the edges. I always say that, and then I end up going crazy. Uh, so there we go. We have a, a good mask here. Let me just kind of get right to the edge here. All right. Let me see what Richard just wrote. I often find that uh, even when I have dark enough shots to render, say, a skylight or window, uh, the overexposed image has so much flare. Yes. Um, okay, so what Richard is saying is a lot of times when you tone map with uh, shooting through a, a 
you know, a dark room with a very bright window, there's kind of like some uh, haloing. And that has to do with a lot of times with the strength of your the tone enhancer. So I'll show that to you what I mean there in the next uh, image. Another thing that happens a lot of times is you get a chromatic aberration, this kind of like purple fringe around high contrast edges. And that's just something that is, uh, uh, it's a combination of lens defect plus it's accentuating it um, when, you when you tone map. So there are ways around it. Um, it's just a matter of finding them. All right, so now what I'm gonna do here is I wanna uh, uh, do something to the concrete. So I'm gonna go to Cyberpunk and I want Cyberpunk to be very, very small strength. So bring it down to zero, just a tiny bit like around there and you can see how it adds a really nice blue. Just like before, bring up the masking brush and invert and then just start painting that in. So I'm gonna uh, just really quickly paint in that blue effect uh, onto, the, um, onto the concrete here. And I'll try to be quick. Let me bring up the mask just to see. See, I already um, got the door, which I'll fix in a second. And I got, I just got, actually I'll get the ceiling too, because that is kind of a concrete slab. All right, almost done. Let's bring up the mask here. And so uh, the shortcut key that I'm using actually to bring up the mask quickly is Command M on a Mac, Control M on a PC. That brings up the, um, the mask. It, it's a toggle, shown hide. Uh, so here, let me uh, switch the paint out and get rid of the effect from the little door jam. And I'm happy with this. Uh, quick scan, let me uh, get the edges here because I can see that there's a change in color. I don't want that to be the case. Um, looking good, I guess. Let's get this area there, okay. Now, last two effects I'm gonna apply, I'll hit add. The first one is gonna be uh, color and tone. Oops. Uh, and we'll do a tonal contrast. Tonal contrast adds texture, so I'm gonna bring out the, sh uh, increase the local contrast and the shadows, and then bring the str overall strength of that layer down to zero and up about 28%. Hit add, and then uh, I'm gonna add a glow. So I'm gonna try something like, um, let me see what Grunge Glow does. Very awesome, gives me a, a kind of a, a, a very video game feel. Bring it to zero, there we go, something like that. We'll hit apply. Actually, I'm gonna save this as a preset because it's a pretty cool preset. We'll call this, um, uh, what should we call this? Forbidden. And then you see, this is something I do a lot actually is I save presets when I think, when I really like the look. And we'll call this uh, great for uh, underground grungy scenes. Okay. How do you control which mask is used with a shortcut? It's the default, Joseph. So this is what Joseph's asking if I take the masking brush. Uh, let me just do a quick mask right there. Oops, that's paint in. Let me go to paint out. So I'm gonna mask out that. Now what Joseph wants to know is when I hit Command M, it's overlay. Basically, Joseph, it's whatever your last um, mask was. So Command M will toggle whatever you have in the mask. So the default mask is overlay. All right, let me just get rid of that because I don't want that to be masked out. Okay, so I hope that answers the question. Um, so the masks uh, poll are not saved. These masks here are not saved in the preset. The only masks that are saved in presets are the ones that are using the masking bug. But if you're using a masking brush, uh, it will not be saved. What will be saved is the strength and the blending mode. So the, Richard, I just, uh, that, that was the same question. Um, and it's a good question because you're right. It would make no sense for me to, for you to get that, uh, that mask. However, let's say I'm doing a, a, a preset that has a, uh, for sunsets and I use a, a graduated filter. 
that I mask using a bug, that does get saved because it's a set coordinate. And then there was a question, where does the preset go by Gerald? If you go to presets and then show presets folder, you'll see the presets here. So there are my presets. And then uh, what did I call it for forbidden halls? There it is right there. All right, so I'm done here. Let's hit apply. Uh, it'll uh, render the effects. And then we'll hit save. And then we'll finish things off in Lightroom. So um, here's Lightroom. There's my image. I'm going to go to the develop module. And I'm going to start by pressing and holding the Option key on a Mac or the Alt key on a PC. So press and hold. And you'll see that uh, the header goes from tone to reset tone. I'm going to start with getting my white point. So you see how the screen's black here, but there are a few little dots in the middle center. That means that I have a few clipped or a few blown highlights, which were right over here. Same thing with a black point. Black point's pretty spot on. Get the correct highlight, the correct shadow. And basically what I'm doing is I'm adjusting the sliders until I barely see any dots. So overall, the exposure was right on. I'm going to go ahead and make the exposure a tiny bit brighter, though, and so I can in, and then boost the contrast, which will darken it. I'll in increase some clarity, and I'm going to increase some vibrance to make the image pop. Next, I'm going to crop it. Uh, and I'm going to crop it because I want uh, the I want the uh, corner right there. I like the swoop of the corner. And also, over here, there's really not uh, much of anything. It's like just dead space. All right, so there's the image. Man, I actually really like that. Uh, go ahead here at a little bit of a vignette. Um, OK, so there we go. Uh, Richard, yeah, the webinar is being recorded. It'll be uh, it'll be on our university page probably by tomorrow. All right, so the last few things I'm going to do here um, is I'm going to use my adjustment brush. I'm going to bring up the exposure, make it a little bit exposure, uh, a little higher exposure. Bring up ca contrast, clarity, and saturation, and that's specifically for this yellow sign here. I want that to pop. Uh, also get the little. Uh, the door and the lock. I want those to pop. And then I'm going to do this door here as well. I want that to pop. OK. Now, uh, you see this kind of uh, light path here? I want to accentuate that. And the way I'm going to do that is create a new brush. I'm going to make a darker exposure with a lot of contrast. And I'm going to darken these tiles. And I'm going to just go here, right through here. And you see how it accentuates that brightness right here? Uh, and then let me go ahead and create a new exposure, this time with a brighter brush. Contrast, clarity, saturation, and just kind of brighten that path up. So it kind of looks like you've got this path. So now if we go to the library, and we compare the 2009 versus the 2011 shots. Pretty much a, a, a huge difference in terms of sensibility. I mean, everything here is, you know, there is no uh, break in sharpness. You can see how we're clipping the sharpness really badly. Um, I mean, look at all this. It's just junk. So. For me, I'm happy that this is actually the effect. The end result is that I'm, I've improved. Um, I think that the overall scene in the 2012 just looks better. It looks more compelling. There's a nice uh, difference in color contrast. You've got warm tones uh, in the tile, cool tones on the walls. Uh, you have that kind of slight green tone from the, from the urban sickness uh, effect. So. I'm really happy with this. I'm really happy with how it came out. And this is just kind of, it just goes to show that you really should, no image is ever done. You're not done with an image. You might have edited it. You might have published it online on a blog or um, on social media. Um, but it should never, especially if the image kind of resonates with you, it should never be done. As you know, put it to rest for a year or two or three, but then go back. See if there's something you could change. And how do you know, uh, you know, what to work on. Uh, I break down my Lightroom catalogs by year. So every year there's a new catalog. And so I'll, I just went for this webinar series. I got in the office at 9 o'clock this morning. 
at about 10 o'clock, I had my coffee and I uh, launched my 2009 catalog and I just went through images. So I literally just picked these images about an hour ago. I didn't try anything with them in advance because I try to be as, uh, you know, kind of honest as possible when I work on my images that they're not scripted. I just play around. And so, because I want to show you, this is how I do things. This is how uh, anyone can do it. All right, let's move on to image number two. Ah, yes. <laughs> I'm not even sure what we can do with this. But this is Montreal uh, in 2009. When did I take this? Uh, June 14th, 2009 in Old Montreal. I actually love this Polish restaurant over here. This was Stash Cafe. That was really good. Um, but man, oh man, look at that halo city. So what is a halo? Um, a halo, is, or the halos when you tone map, indicates that when a a uh, dark area or a specific tone reaches a hard contrast edge. So in this case here, you're going from a blue sky to this very dark um, rooftop. The tone mapping algorithm tries to smooth out that area. And if you don't have the proper brackets, meaning you don't have enough information, tonal information, it tends to brighten. It tends to over brighten. And this is why you have halos that follow the edges of things is because um, it reaches a high contrast edge and it doesn't know what to do. Now, granted, this was using an older version of Photomatix, a three-year-old version. So they've come a long way with their algorithms as well, but it's, it goes to show how important um, uh, getting the proper brackets are. Let me just see, I have a few questions here. From Ken, does tone map mean that the image contains a full range of tone present in the image? Great question. So let me do that question first. So what Ken's asking is, Tone mapping, what does that signify? Tone mapping is basically a, a, a version of HDR. So HDR, high dynamic range, can be achieved several ways. Tone mapping is one of them. Another way you can achieve HDR is by masking in, doing an exposure blend. So if I took, say, uh, this image and uh, this image, and so I, let's say I took this image into Photoshop and then I masked in the sky without anything else, that technically would be an HDR image because you're uh, capturing the full tonal range of the scene. You're capturing the, sh the shadows, the highlights, and the midtones. Tone mapping is a different process. That's more of a software-based solution where um, software goes through uh, this image, this image, and this image. It goes through pixel by pixel, and it tries to analyze which are the best exposure values for each pixel, and that is your tone mapped image. So it'll go through and it'll say, ah, the exposure in this image is good uh, for the sky, but the exposure uh, in this image is good for the midtones, and the exposure here is good for the shadows. And so it tries to combine them all. The problem is if you don't have enough, like in retrospect, I definitely don't have enough exposure information for these shadows. And then under the car, I definitely don't have enough exposure information. So it's going to try to extrapolate that. Um, and when it does, a lot of times you get uh, halos. Now, Joseph's asking, when you republish an image, do you state that the image has been altered? Absolutely, Joseph, absolutely. Uh, I take pride in, in showing the bad stuff with the good stuff. You know, I'm not going to, I'm not, I would never be uh, arrogant enough to say that, you know, only my best stuff is ever shown. No, there's a learning process involved with this, This is which is why I do these webinars. And so if I, if I do, let's say I took that previous image and I put it online, uh, I would, I would uh, absolutely, not only would I mention it was reprocessed, but if the older image was published, I would link to it, just so that people can uh, see the difference. Uh, Jay's asking a great question about the starbursts over here. Um, are they natural or are they um, software? These are 100% straight out of camera, Jay. And the reason for that is, if you look at the aperture, uh, I was using my 16 to 35 millimeter Canon um, at f11. So what happens is uh, with lenses, when you point a lens at a specular highlight, like a bright light source, uh, mostly like street lamps, uh, if you uh, close down your aperture to say anywhere from, usually you'll start to see it anywhere smaller than f8, but definitely with f11 uh, and f16, what you're seeing is the light passing through the blades of the aperture. And so this is the, what's recorded um, are these bursts. So it's 100% natural. Um, I don't use soft. I never, ever, ever, ever add starbursts, ever. I think that's, I, I just think that's tacky. If, um, if it's in camera, no problem. And if I didn't want that, I would shoot it at a larger aperture and it would be minimized. 
All right, so let's take these uh, three exposures and let's see what Photomatix gives us. Um, I'm not sure, but we'll try. Nothing wrong with saying that an image is not salvageable, but at least it hopefully could be better. All right, this isn't bad actually. This is not bad. So earlier there was a question, um, where was it? Oh, with Richard's question about the, the color the chromatic aberration. The slider that you want to adjust is a lot of times is the lighting adjustments and then also the luminosity and the detail contrast sliders. Those will help you. If you're finding that you get a lot of um, fringing, bring this lighting adjustment more to the right and it'll give you a more subtle tone map. And the more you bring it to the left, the more kind of, uh, you know, HDR-ish it looks, more, more uh, surreal. So here, let's bring up, uh, I'm looking at the uh, histogram here. I'm going to try bringing up some luminosity. Um, and you could see here, I have just this loss of information here. It's really weird. Um, let me bring down the luminosity. Maybe that'll help. That's just, that's just bizarre. I wonder if, I guess there might not be anything I could do there. Uh, if I bring up some detail contrast, yeah, that's not helping at all. Hmm. Okay, I know what I'll do here. I mean, we'll, we'll get this going. Again, this is an evolution of processing, working with, um, with what we've got. Um, so I'm just trying to get a good even exposure. Something like that is looking good. And I always tend to go brighter than normal because stylization tends to darken the image. But I am, I am really, like, tripping out over what happened here. All right. Can't do anything about it. Let me look at the exposures. I'm really ex I guess, I guess it just doesn't have a lot of information there. But to give me that. Hmm. Okay. So be it. Uh, let's go ahead now and uh, go into the suite. Let's stylize it. But I've got a few tricks on my sleeve. Do I have a correct perspective? Uh, yeah, Richard, I, I definitely, well, mostly um, I shoot with, the tilt, with tilt shift lenses. When I shot this in 2009, uh, I didn't own the tilt shift lens, the 17 millimeter or the 24. Had I had them, I definitely would have. Um, I would have shot and shifted to straighten out uh, the perspective. And I could, but I'm worried that I'll lose some of this information here on the left. Okay, let's go to effects and let's just do a kind of a, I'm thinking something very subtle. Uh, we'll go to, uh, let's think, movie looks. And I'm going to go to something like um, Return of the King. It's going to be bright when it comes in, which is fine because I'm going to see what blending modes we've got to play with. I'm going to start multiply, soft light, hard light. Ooh, hard light's good. But we'll bring it down to zero. Just make it pop a bit, a little bit more. OK, that's good. Uh, let's hit Add. Next thing I'm going to do is add just enough darkness because it's a bit too bright. See, that desaturates things, which I don't want. Let's bring it down to zero just a tiny bit. OK. And then. Um, what I might do is, hmm, I don't want to go too, get too much more stylization because <clears throat> I want to keep the sky clean. I'm thinking maybe something like um, Havana again. Where's Havana? There it is. Havana, very small amount, maybe with a blending mode. Ah, that could work. The sky, this building is killing me. All right, now let's go ahead, add a glow. I'm not even gonna add any tonal contrast because that's just gonna, that's just gonna be too much, but I, I can add a glow. Uh, let's think about deep forest. Okay, that's good. Bring it to zero, just a little bit here. And let's compare, command P or control P. Let's hit add, and I'm gonna that this road. I'm gonna go to the movie looks, and I'm gonna go to um, uh, let's do let's see what Grunge Goddess does. I want the road to stand out, so I'll bring it to zero. Okay, take the masking brush, 
and invert it. Let's just paint that in on the road. See, showing the mask is always good because a lot of times you just end up missing certain areas. You think you get it, but you, you actually didn't. So we'll go here, and there we go. Okay, hide that mask. Let's bring it up a little bit more so it pops. All right. Richard, let me see what Richard's asking. Can I bring up two small windows to see difference in effects? Um, no, Richard. The only thing you can do is bring up um, like a before or after. You can split the screen, but you can't actually have multiple windows with different effects showing. All right, so from here, uh, let's hit Apply. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to Focal Point. All right, so with focal point, let's reset everything. Here's the focus bug. I'm going to take my focus bug, and I'm going to change it from round to planar. And I'm going to make this the horizontal bug. I'm going to put it right down here in the foreground. And then I'm going to tilt it. By tilting it, uh, well, to tilt it, you put the cursor inside the body of the bug. You press the Option key on the Mac or the Alt key on a PC, and you drag up or down. All right, so that's my uh, horizontal plane. Now I want my vertical plane. I'm going to hit plus, second bug, planar. And I'm going to put it over here on the right. So you can see basically that I really wasn't happy with that building. And I can actually mitigate that by um, blurring it out. <laughs> All right, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to increase the feather, which is the transition. Um, and then I'm going to take my masking. I'm also going to bring down the amount of blur because it's a bit too blurry, something like that. I'm also going to drop the brightness of that background. Oh, I actually need a third bug for the right side here. So I'm going to go one more planar bug. I'm going to put this really narrow on the right here. There we go. So now we have a nice kind of even plane of focus. Take the masking brush. Make sure I'm set to paint focus at 100%, and I want that sign right here to be in focus. There we go. And even uh, the little bit of the holder there, I want that in focus and the light there. And I want these flowers in focus. I want the doorway in focus. So I'm essentially controlling where the focus is. And that's really good. That's I'm happy with that. Um, it gives actually a nice three-dimensional feel. I'm going to, again, boost the contrast of that background, drop the brightness. Um, and we are, I think, good to go. Let me bring out some of the highlight bloom. That's going to make the specular highlights brighter in that background. OK. How do you export presets, Avi? There is nothing to export. You just, like I showed you before, you go to the presets folder. And that's, you just give those files to anyone. But there is no export presets. OK. So here we're done in the suite. We used effects and focal point. I'm going to quit out of here, and I'm going to finish things up in Lightroom. All right, so here's our stylized version. We'll go to Develop. Let's go get our proper tones. White point is good. Black point is good. Let me actually bring the white point up a bit. OK. Uh, highlights are good. Black or the shadows are good. And now let's drop the brightness a bit. Boost the contrast, boost some clarity. I'm going to drop the saturation in the sky here. So I'm going to take the um, adjustment brush, go to saturation. It's just a bit too blue for me. So I'm going to just desaturate the whole sky. That's good. I'm OK with that. Um, and then uh, just probably an aggressive uh, vignette. Uh, and then what I'll do is uh, graduate filter on exposure, brighten it up a bit. So what this is going to do is it's going to allow me to brighten this left side because I want that to be brighter. And then I'll do one more from the bottom up. 
just so that this area here is brighter than this area. Last thing, the little finish, finishing touches um, is the adjustment brush will do a brighter exposure with contrast and clarity and saturation. And here's where I like to bring out details. So things like the sign here, I want that to be bright. I want the little menu uh, display to be bright and then this window and then inside here. I might actually bring up the exposure a bit for all of that. There we go. And a little flowers too. While we're at it, the manhole cover. Now what I'm gonna do is take a new brush. Uh, let's go to exposure, darken. Um, that. Uh, license plate is too dark, or too, was too bright for me. Um, in fact, I probably should have just removed it because it's someone's license plate. Can you adjust the ghosting people on the bottom right? Oh, I didn't even see them. Uh, I could have, uh, Mac, but um, I'm, I didn't even see them. I could have uh, fixed them in, in uh, photomatics. I, I didn't even notice. I kind of like them, actually. Let me go back. I'm going to make them brighter. Uh, take this adjustment brush. Let's paint them. That's too bright, so let's undo. Let's go new. I'll create a whole new one just for them. I really like them, actually, because it adds a sense of motion. It adds a sense of, like, life. But, yeah, I, I, I didn't even notice them. Cool. So, how do you get the drop down menu to come up in the adjustment brush mark? It's just here. Go to the develop module. Bring down the adjustment brush, and then it's the effect. You have it's right here. It's the first one. All right. So let's compare the two. So this is this one versus 2009 versus 2012. All right. So the sky is, in my opinion, 100% better, given what we have to work with. Um, I cropped in a little tighter, which is fine. I, I that's actually I agree with that. I would have cropped in a little bit tighter, but you can, you know, the uh, the building itself is a lot more natural. Where are the people? Well, the person there's a person here, but I must have cropped in and removed the people. Yeah, I definitely cropped in. You can see how I, the 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 border is through halfway of the car, and over here it's there. So. Um, that's basically the crop there. And I can do that. I can recreate that. But overall, I find that this image is much more natural, but still stylized. You know, it has some style to it. Whereas this one, um, yeah, it's not very, <laughs> not very pretty. So, all right. So that's, um, that's basically what I've got today for you guys. Um, let me just bring it out here. Um, I don't really, oh, there was a, there was a question about the seven, oh, is the 17 millimeter tilt shift lens the best lens on a full frame sensor? Paulie, um, that's a tough question. Uh, the 17 millimeter tilt shift lens is my favorite lens, um, but it's not necessarily the most uh, cost effective um, because it's uh, it's very expensive and it uh, has a, a learning curve to it, and it doesn't have autofocus. So, uh, if you're looking for an ultra wide lens for for Canon full frames, uh, I would recommend either the uh, Canon 17 to 40 which is kind of like the lower end uh, for budget than the 16 to 35, which is a mid-grade. And then my favorite lens that I own outside of the 17 is the 14 millimeter prime. So thank you, Linda and Craig. I appreciate that. Um, so we'll be doing these again. Uh, Jay, thank you. Um, every month. The Nikon 12 to 24, well, I'm not a Nikon shooter tapas, but the Nikon, if you're a Nikon shooter, the Nikon, is it, no, it's the 14 to 24, it's not 12 to 24, as far as I know, I believe it's the 14 to 24. If Canon made that lens, I would sell my 14 in a second and buy the, the 14 to 24. Um, I think that's like one of the best ranges. What printer would you use to print out your work? I don't know, Paul, I don't really use, um, I don't print my work much, but when I do, I print it on canvas or metal. Ah, uh, yeah, and Jack, the 10 to 24, Canon makes for the uh, EFS system for their crop sensors. <coughs> a 10 to, tw it's a 10 to 22 actually, Jack, 
but it's a fantastic lens if you have a crop sensor and you want to get ultra wide. Um, how do I like the metal prints, Craig? Um, very. If you print the right image for metal, it looks amazing. It has to be. I like contrasty images with with um, a lot of metallic tone. Those will look great on metal prints. Um, but if it's more of a flat landscape image, I will go for canvas because I like the, the texture. I'd take it to a lab, Paula. For metal, for the metal prints, I go to Empix, and for um, canvas, I go to Artistic Photo Canvas, APC, out of Florida. Uh, 